Now back to our interview with broadcaster Bob Schellenberg. In this part of the interview, Schellenberg talks about challenges to the station's license. So let's go back to uh, hell, as you said, uh, <laughs> the, the, the period of the license challenges. It, it was protracted. It went on and on and on. Two years. And, uh, <coughs> and you lived with this shadow over your operation. Uh, and, and I guess you tried to do what you always did without any regard to this threat of the, on the license. Well, you were there, and you may have remembered. I, I used to talk to the news people and say, look, we're not going to change your operation. These people are wrong. We're right. So I don't want the influence of the outside. And they were facing with every day, of course, as, as all of us were. Uh, don't change your operation. We're not going to change your editorial policy, nor did we. We were still as vigorous and as uh, thought-provoking in our editorials as we had been before. And our, our news department really did not decline in its uh, aggressiveness. So during that period, we didn't bend to the, the will or the conscience of this group of people, feeling that we had the, the major portion of people, maybe not the select few of, in relative terms, of licensed challenges. And there were times when uh, you must have been saying, when is this nightmare going Please to go away. Oh, it was, if actually I've, I've thought about that. If it hadn't been for my wife and my family, I don't know that I could have held together. Mm -hmm. Because going home at night, I'd get home at maybe 7, 7.15 or so, uh, <coughs> uh, and see some of the children. And my wife, who was faced with the same problems I was on a daily basis. Mm -hmm. Of course, the social s circle that she was running in had the same wives of the people who were challenging. And they always said the same thing, which was interesting. They'd come to me at a uh, reception and say, Bob, this isn't against you. Yeah. This is against the Washington Post. All right. They really thought that we were puppets. Mm -hmm. They really thought there were strings from Washington to Jacksonville, and they were yanking strings, and we were responding. That couldn't have been further from the truth. I never, in the time that I was here, ever had anyone call me about anything in the editorial or news department. And do you think that's, uh, there's a lot of TV stations around the country uh, that are owned by big corporations, mm -hmm. and, and, you know, and people complain about no local ownership and so forth. Sure. Uh, is there that same degree of autonomy, or is, is the Washington Post somewhat uh, unique in that respect? I always suspect, <coughs> excuse me, I always suspect that we were unique in that case. Uh, <coughs> excuse me. So they, uh, the Washington Post management, uh, going back to Catherine Graham and, and others, uh, they were trying to make money, of course, like any corporation. They just saw this as good, a, a good way to operate TV stations, leaving a maximum amount of control at the local level. Yeah, and uh, as I say, that the, uh, the things we did, and there were there were a lot of things that uh, clearly was were in opposition to editorial stands that the Washington Post had taken, mm -hmm. which is, but no one from the Washington Post ever said this is the line the Post is taking, you know, jump in the, the train. Uh, we were basically unaware of what positions they were taking. We independently took our position, and if it was in conflict, it was in conflict. Uh, it would be interesting to pause for a moment and talk about that. <laughs> Uh, the, the process of evolving editorial policy is uh, interesting. People find it very hard to believe that there was an actual kind of democratic editorial board that made decisions on what the station's editorial policy would be. And the boss, which would be you in a lot of cases, didn't always prevail. The, uh, I can remember one distinctively. Uh, there were really two. You and I fervently disagreed on. And we argued over, I bet, three sessions. We had a session, for those who don't know, we had a session each week. Mm -hmm. uh, you would bring subject matter to the, the editorial board. Uh, we would prepare conversations about what we thought the issue was. Uh, and that two issues would come up regularly for three weeks. And as much as I try to convince you that you were wrong, uh, the editorial board uh, voted me out. Well, 
The fact is, a lot of people who believe the same way as I did thought, as many people did, that I control the editorial yeah. board. And they come up what and say, What do you mean? You're the boss. How, how, could, you not, <laughs> how could you let this happen? Uh, and I try to explain to them what editorials are all about. Yeah. Uh, and that and takes how a the system somewhat unique, I think. That's right. Operated. That's right. And I, I know you remember the two issues we had. Uh, I'm not sure. Maybe I should write them down and see uh, yeah. <laughs> what, what are they? <laughs> Now they were. Uh, are you going to ask me what no, they no, were? I'm going to ask you to name them. <laughs> well, one was gun control, and okay. the other one was uh, Roe versus Wade, ah. which okay. was one of our biggies. Yep, yep. Well, it, it uh, a lot of uh, interesting sessions with that editorial board. Well, and they were all outspoken. Yeah. I mean, to have an editorial editorial board uh, that we had that was outspoken, opinionated, so that what we finally resolved was a, an issue that had been clearly discussed mm -hmm. and finally a resolution that we all were comfortable with. Yeah. And we usually got 100% agreement. Mm -hmm. And uh, of course <laughs> the policy was, and, and still is to some extent, I guess, um, we, we encouraged people to come on and take us on in uh, a, a reply right. to an editorial. Which was always fun. Yeah, well, that was your job, uh, <laughs> uh, edit, editing those people. Uh. Well, I, I, there may be other things that we want to talk about uh, in your uh, TV4 part of your career. But let's, uh, in, in 1983, if my notes, which came from you, <laughs> are correct, uh, you left Channel 4 and then embarked on some new careers. So, uh, <laughs> New careers is correct. Yeah, uh, I retired politics myself. Politics of all things. Well, as you know, uh, well, you as well as uh, I was always interested in the political system. Mm -hmm. uh, and we editorialized about it a lot, about uh, what was wrong and what was right. And uh, shortly after I <coughs> left Channel 4, a group was formed. And our purpose really was clear. We wanted to change the complexion of the city council. We thought the city council were politicians and not uh, truly representative of the community of Jacksonville. We wanted people who had experience, who, had, who could articulate issues and thoughtfully make a decision. And we decided that many of the people on the council were not that character uh, kind. So we used to, we met every week at the then Sheridan Hotel. And I guess it was six of us. We divided this community up into uh, sections. And each one of us had responsibility in the section to find somebody that we could recommend to run. Well, we worked and worked and worked. We finally came up with two people that we were convinced would go. And both of them backed out because of the uh, uh, public notice that they had to pick up. And they said, my finances are my own. Oh, the financial disclosure. Fine. Yeah. Uh, and I'm not going to do that. And of yeah. course, as you know, financial disclosure isn't any big thing anyway. But the point is, we had come to an absolute brick wall. Mm -hmm. uh, and we looked around the room, and they said, if any of you want to run. Well, I had just retired, and it kind of focused on me and saying, why don't you run? And I said I had no interest in becoming a, a career politician. And I said, no, don't be a career politician. Go in there for a while. I said, all right, I'll do it. So I did, and uh, fortunately for me, the public responded, and I was elected. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so it was, it was a good experience. So you kept that uh, commitment, basically, to serve one term. Exactly. And uh, then kind of back into journalism. <laughs> that was funny, because a, a search firm came to me and asked me if I'd be interested in becoming a publisher of a business newspaper. That was fascinating to me. Actually, uh, I wasn't familiar, uh, greatly familiar with the magazine, the, the newspaper in the first mm -hmm. place. So I made myself familiar with the, the newspaper. I said, yes, I think I'd least like to talk to you about it. So I went out to Kansas City and talked to the people out there. And they had a, a great vision about what this was going to do. 
And I said, all right, I'll give it a try. Well, what they didn't tell me is they clearly were trying to fire one of the lead people in the organization, and they didn't have the wherewithal to do it themselves. So I became the ax man <laughs> to uh, ax this person uh, after I had developed a series of paperwork on him. And it became a, a, a jungle. Uh, we had to change locks and all that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. And I got uh, a, a great news director uh, who came in, who was on the staff. And so we proceeded for about two years. And at that point, I said, look, I'll bring you out of the red. And it was bleeding pretty badly. Uh, and then, then I've got to go, because it was like, Eight to eight a day, uh, mm -hmm. and that's. I figured at retirement I deserved a little better than that. Yeah. yeah. So I decided that, uh, convinced myself, and convinced them they were going to be, a black th for a while, and bid them farewell. Uh, <laughs> but before actual retirement, there was another uh, job you did for a while. Uh, with the Baptist Hospital, yeah. mm -hmm. uh, Bill Mason, who I'd known asked me if I would come over there to help him with some issues that they had. One was the access to the hospital. Uh, as you know, the railroad interferes with people going into the hospital. Mm -hmm. uh, and the uh, highway system was beginning to build uh, the entrance to the new bridge. And so there were issues like that. Uh, and then later on, there was an issue of the crosswalk. Uh, we finally. I came up with an, an idea, uh, two ideas, of the, uh, the access to the hospital. One was a tunnel. Mm -hmm. The tunnel became uh, not very solvable because underneath that is all water. Right. It became uh, an undoable project. Mm -hmm. A bridge was not viable. But there was a piece of land that was then dedicated to Bernatural, uh parking lot that Baptists had willed to potential. Then I said, ask them to give it back to you, and then we'll use that, giving you access out. Prudential wouldn't move. Uh, they said, that's, you know, we need that piece. And it wasn't that large a piece of property. I finally got to the highway system and got them to put a ramp down uh, to a block away from the uh, parking lot. Uh, then Bill came up and said, I want to build a walkway between the Children's Hospital and, and mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. Wolfson. And at that point, the, the bridge had not been built. And I said, that's kind of way out. I said, I don't know how you do that. So I went to the highway department, and they said, you know, once we build a bridge, we have to have certain clearances. And I said, can you judge the clearances now? And he said, no, we can't. I said, well, give me the, the highest bridge number you can come up with. So they did. So I went back to Bill and I said, what you have to do is to build this thing so many feet above the highway, mm -hmm. and I think you can get it done. Well, we met on the roof of the Wolfson Hospital one day and looked down at where the, the and the Department of Transportation people and Bill and others from the hospital were looking at this vision that he had. And he really wanted to sell the walkway to Disney as a, uh, entrance to Disney with a sign up in front, uh, welcome to Florida and welcome to Disneyland, that sort of thing. Well, that didn't work out. But uh, he put that up before, literally before the, the bridge was complete. And uh, so it worked out pretty well. But that all, it all helped. And it, again, another retirement. Yeah, yeah. And this one was uh, for good, right? Well, I've, I've retired more than most people do. Yeah. That was an interview with Bob Schellenberg, one of Jacksonville's broadcasting pioneers. He was sales manager and general manager at WJXT TV4 for many years. You can see other interviews in this series of oral histories on the Jacksonville Historical Society's website, www.jackshistory.com. That's our show for tonight. So long, everyone.